Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is the series for the first three months of 2014 entitled Discipleship. This is lesson number 11 in that series entitled Discipling Spiritual Leaders. And it's a lesson about how Jesus picked out his disciples and what he hoped that they would accomplish from his training and his teaching. We'll get into that in a moment, but, and we're going to use a lot of Bible verses. So get your Bible if you have it handy, and let's bow our heads and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to welcome you, to join us, uh, not that you're ever distant, but that we need your guidance in talking about these things and explaining them to the best we, of our ability. Help us to understand you better through this lesson is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't think I need to tell anyone who's listening that Jesus to chose how many disciples? Twelve. Whoa. Twelve. Um, there are some who would suggest that one of them Judas, who ended up being the traitor, sort of pushed his way into the crowd. He wasn't really chosen by Jesus. Jesus, remember, said, I know who I've chosen. And uh, perhaps he knew he didn't cho choose Judas. In any case, there were 12 of them. <clears throat> and he did two things. He had two goals. He was a master teacher and a master trainer. What's the difference between a teacher and a trainer? Jay, you ought to be good at that. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, a trainer, um, a classic trainer, would just um, show someone basic skills or maybe even advanced skills. <clears throat> a teacher, on the other hand, is going to go beyond just the, the training, um, emphasize perhaps uh, the art of the thing, um, the, um, the moral integrity or worth of uh, of what's involved there, um, and a broader perspective of um, how whatever you're learning there relates to um, all a all aspects. So of you're saying involved. a teacher basically <coughs> gives information as well as skills. A trainer would be mainly focused on the skills. Okay. So what skills did Jesus need to teach? What information did he need to pass along? What were his challenges in doing that? And I'm going to suggest something that uh, you might not have heard before, but I think it's really important. Jesus knew in dealing with these men that one of his biggest job was going to be unteaching. What do we mean by unteaching? They were raised on a particular outlook at the regarding the emergence of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And what the Messiah was going to do, remember, to them, the Messiah was going to come. He was going to beat the Romans in one way or another. He was going <clears> to <throat> drive them out so they would no longer be servant to the Romans at all. And some thought he was going to go on beyond that and, and make them rulers of the world. And they were certain. They were absolutely certain that that's what the Messiah was going to do. Where did they get that kind of an idea? From the Bible. How did they get it from the Bible? From the, <coughs> the, the teachers of the day that should have known better. Okay, but there were reasons. We, we, we need to be as honest with them as we can. There were reasons why they came up with those opinions. There are passages that speak about um, a ruling nation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they're going to um, have a, are going to reign as David reigned, and he was a you know, a temporal king, mm -hmm. and uh, there's all kinds of all kinds of things like that you can focus and concentrate on. Now, l let me, and I don't want to, you know, monopolize the time here, but just to to make that point quite clear, we as Adventists would understand, and I I think we're right on this particular point, that there were prophecies in the Old Testament that predicted the first coming of Jesus. There are other prophecies that predicted the second coming, and there's even one or two that talk about his third coming in the Old Testament. But when you read those prophecies in the Old Testament, you can't tell 
if you don't know about the New Testament, you can't tell that this is first coming, second coming, or third coming. So the main text that they use to support the idea that Messiah is going to come, he's going to rule the world, and he's going to get rid of all their enemies, etc., came from their taking texts that we now believe apply to the second coming and applying them to the first coming. So, you know, we need to be a little bit gentle with them in that respect. Now, of let's... Of course they... You know? Why in the world would they think there's a second coming if right, there's exactly. a first coming? Yeah. So, I was about what I was, what I was about to say. If you read the Old Testament and you don't have any other idea, you would say, okay, there's going to be only, only going to be one coming. If you read the New Testament and leave off the last three chapters, you would say there's only going to be two comings. When you read the last three chapters of the New Testament, you discover there's going to be a third coming. And as far as we know, the, none of the disciples have, except John ever knew that there was going to be a third coming. After a millennium and a third coming. They knew nothing about it. None of them talk about that except John at the very end of the book of Revelation. Well, but there's, there's, another, there's another component here, and perhaps it's a human component, the human element, but that's not the only thing people have had a, a tendency to misunder, misunderstand. Sure. Um, what about Abraham? He seemed to have certain uh, uh, impressions about what was going to happen with he was going to have all of these children and so forth, and nothing was happening. And it appeared to be a little different than what he thought. Um, it seems to me like that may be something within the human disposition. To, to, it's, and to be, from speaking from the human point, it seems like sometimes God seems to leave out all of the important details. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, this is what's going to happen, and when you draw the natural conclusion, what would appear to be the natural conclusion, and it seems like, it seems like, mm -hmm. a lot of the details are kind of foggy. Is God trying to keep us guessing? Well, I don't know. I'm just saying it sure <laughs> seems like there's a lot of stuff. I can empathize deeply with the people in the, in the Old Testament. Well, just to illustrate this, I don't want to spend <clears throat> a lot more time on it. Look at Luke 18, verses 31 to 34. Jesus took the twelve disciples aside. Now, wh what's he doing here? They are traveling with a large group of people from Jericho up to Jerusalem just before his final Passover. One week later, he's going to be crucified. So this is one week before his crucifixion. And they're traveling with this big group. And they're, So Jesus takes them aside and said to them, Listen, we're going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles... Is that difficult to understand? Who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. Now, from a purely literal sense, is there any of those words that are hard to understand? No. No. When Jesus said, uh, we're going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true, I think they stopped listening at that time and their imagination went to yeah. what they had thought the prophets said. Yeah. So when Jesus said he will be handed over to the Gentiles, they were thinking their own thoughts about power and yeah. glory. And Jesus was referring to, him, <coughs> to himself as the son of man, but I think they probably had a disconnect. He must be talking about somebody else. Maybe. Yeah. You know, he'd, 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 he could have lost him there, it, too. It just <clears throat> it didn't fit their paradigm. Or it, it may have thought fit the paradigm exactly. Um, they're used to not understanding. They've got this whole <clears throat> Old Testament stuff that he seems to be clarifying on and, and straightening out. So they didn't understand that when it seemed like gobbledygook. And this seems like gobbledygook. So they probably don't understand that either. But don't you think the leaders of the day, if they had have been doing their job <coughs> properly, they should have realized what was going on, but they turned it into a very profitable business and maintained their position in doing so. Now, let, me, let me point out something very interesting. And let me read this verse 34 here, which is a punchline. But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was <coughs> hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. Okay? Does that mean that God intentionally hid the meaning? 
Well, the interesting thing, if you go to the writings of Ellen White, she says that Judas, of all people, went to the scribes and Pharisees and told them when he was preparing to betray Jesus, told them a little bit about him, where he was, da, 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 and, and I, what, we don't know exactly what he told them, but they, the Bible goes on to say, they said to Pilate, this deceiver said that he was going to rise on the third day. How come they got it third hand and the disciples didn't get it first hand? Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, but there's, there's shades of meaning in hidden. As you, 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 you deleted, deleted rather, and I think rightly so, I don't think God hid it. But if they're uneducated people, they don't necessarily follow what's going on at that time, and that happens today. Mm -hmm. I don't think they really believed Jesus was going to rise the third day. Even the, the <coughs> I didn't believe that. They didn't that's think they were going to lose the leader. Yeah, either. that's why they sent people. They <coughs> said just in case they steal the body and say it did go. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they believed that either. Well, it, it happens. It happens today. There was a recent article in the Review by Clifford Goldstein talking about the concept that most of the great theologians of the age, our contemporary age, think that. Um, that, uh, um, oh, why, why can't I think of that guy's name? Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, is, uh, what was it, is the, is the, the, the Messiah or, or something like that? Yeah. And he, uh, based on the, the prophecies of Daniel and so forth, and it doesn't fit any of those things. Yeah. Well, notice this very interesting point, and, I'm, and then we'll move on. Acts 1, verse 6. After the resurrection, we don't know exactly how long after the resurrection, but here's, when the apostles met together with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time give the kingdom back to Israel? Yeah. Even after all of that, they're still thinking, okay, maybe there's still a chance. <laughs> wow. They went back to their way of thinking even after the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Well, they well, may have they may have been giving it up finally, but they were just going to ask him one last time. That's, yeah. that's what it could be too. Okay, now I'm going, to, I'm going to hit the hard stuff. How many of the things that we believe are true are not really true? Yeah, Why? Ken. Huh? Yeah, Ken. <laughs> How many things do you believe are yeah. true that aren't really true? Well, okay, and, and let's go on to the, the next spot. Next question, how do you teach someone to be self-sacrificing, ready to live in hardship, even be willing to die for a certain kind of truth? Can such a thing be taught in, cl in a classroom setting? No. That's no. why he had to demonstrate. No, you can't Only, teach that. Yeah. Romans, no Romans 3.25, he demonstrated. Yeah, he demonstrated, <laughs> but the, but yeah. still. You can't, you can't sit around in a group, you can't write it down in, in books yeah. and expect people to understand it until you see it physically yeah. happen. It's but but <laughs> you know, you're still saying that it's being taught. I'm not well, sure. Um, no, no, it's I'm caught. Not sure. It's what? It's well, caught, yeah. one, one it's both. famous, one famous that professor too. said, that kind of stuff cannot be taught. It has to be caught. And when he said caught, what he meant is, you have to associate with someone who really lives that kind of a life for a period of time and really intimately associate with them before you sort of get it. Romans 3, 25 and 26, that's what, if you fit that with Colossians 1, 19 and 20 and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, they caught it. Yeah. The angels Paul, caught it. Paul did. And, and Paul and caught it. Let, what, but Paul caught it, uh, look, reflecting back 30, yeah. 25, 30 years. But you never years. know who is getting it and who isn't until yeah. the crisis comes. Because like when the Nazis started their march all over Europe, there were underground, this railroads and whatever, saving the Jews mm -hmm. at the risk of the people's own lives yep. in many countries, mm -hmm. Holland, France, yep. England, other countries. So those people had to absorb this, what you said, uh, and so it can be taught. To, uh, well, it can be caught. It can those be people, caught. Those people did what they did because they had friends 
who are Jews, for example, or, or, or people who are under some kind of pressure, and they said, we're not going to let this happen to our friends. And so... It wasn't even their friends. They so, did it for, for Jewish strangers. Yeah, but usually if you go and look at the stories, and I'm not, I'm not claiming to be the world's expert on this, but the stories I've read, they started out with their friends, and then they, start, well, they, they developed a system, and then pretty soon it was almost anybody who came along, they were, they were doing it. Yeah, Jim? Well, Romans 3, 25 and 26, to this day, over the last yeah. 2,000 years, majority theologians yeah. and preachers and people don't understand what that, those two verses mean. Yeah. Which two verses? Romans 3, 25 and 26. Yeah. Jesus' death them? was to demonstrate oh. God's righteousness. Yeah. Three times it says it. But they, most translations muddy it up. Yeah. Well, not well, only that, these, these same theologians, the scholars, don't believe that angels <clears throat> exist. They certainly don't believe that the devil exists. So how can you talk to them about a great controversy? And they don't look at the book of Daniel as prophecy. Yeah. You know, you guys, um, I am the biggest chicken in the world, mm -hmm. and I know it. And I'm relying totally on the Holy Spirit to make me do the right thing. Okay. And that's, that's where I'm going. And I don't care. I, I can see all kinds of heroism. I don't know. I'm not going to trust that in, in rubbing off on me. Okay. But I just know that this, the Spirit will But you're ready to absorb work. it if it does come down. Well, that's a little different than being taught. I don't know. Oh. Yeah, okay, let, let, let's, let's ask the next question. I mean, let's be honest with the information we have in front of us. How many disciples did Jesus have? Now, this is a trick question. Let me just warn you. Many. <laughs> many, many more Okay, than we know about the 12. Mm -hmm. yeah. Luke 8, 1 to 3, we won't take time to read that right now. There are a number of women who are following mm -hmm. him who helped to support the group. When the disciples got together after the crucifixion, there were how many? 120 in the upper room. That's probably because that's all they could get in the upper room. And that's a lot of people in one room. 120. And it wasn't very long before there were thousands. And these were people, by and large, I am sure, that had seen Jesus, heard him, been healed by him, whatever, whatever, whatever. And when they sort of realized this, how things were playing out, they said, I'm on his side, and, and you can go to Acts 6, 7, and Acts 15, 5, and you discover great numbers of Pharisees and priests became followers of Jesus. So how many disciples did Jesus have? Maybe. We have no idea. Yeah, yeah. There were a lot of them, just a lot of them weren't following openly. Well, what does disciple mean? It means a follower, a learner. A learner. An apprentice. Learner. You were, and supposed, these were, to, you were all... supposed to learn that from the first lesson. Oh, these were all Jewish people. Well, I know what Most I meant, like. but I wanted you to say. Yeah, to say it. but but there's very when you say there was these were all Jewish people, you need to recognize something that many people have not recognized, and I don't know whether we should take time to do it. But now let's let's do it real quick. Look at Mark, chapter three, and what is it? The first six verses, I think. No. It's uh, further down, starting with verse 7, after the first six verses. Jesus and his disciples went away to Lake Galilee, and a large crowd followed him. Now remember that we've seen in a number of places that the, 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 the Pharisees particularly were always trying to hound Jesus' steps to try to catch him saying something that they could use against him, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the context in which they're hounding Jesus' steps. Notice this. They had come from this crowd. They had come from Galilee, from Judea, from Jerusalem, from the territory of Idumea. How far away is Idumea? On the east side of the Dead Sea. Several hundred. No, it's, it's way south. south yes. Way down in the south. Yeah. How hundreds miles? of miles. Hundreds toward, of toward miles. Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it's almost into Saudi Arabia. Long ways from Galilee. And these people are up here from the territory on the east side of the Jordan. That's Perea. Okay. Those, who lives in, in Udemy and who lives in Priya? These are mostly Gentiles. Mm. And from the region around the cities of Tyre and Sidon. So who's in this, this crowd that's mixing with Jesus? All sorts. Big crew. All kinds of people, right? I wonder how this, I wonder if the 
Sadducees ever felt uncomfortable, <laughs> I mean, not Sadducees, the Pharisees ever felt uncomfortable following Jesus with all these other people crowding in, trying to get healed and that kind of stuff. Because they could not let the shadow of a Gentile fall on them. So if they're in the crowd, there's too many shadows to avoid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did Jesus ever pick like one of the disciples to be like head of all the group? No. Not really, but there seems like there's preference to three. He took the three with him often because apparently, now, did he take them with him because they needed more teaching? <coughs> or did he take them with him because they were really going to be leaders in the group? More responsive, perhaps, to his, yeah. maybe more, inter yeah, more awesome. attuned to what he was saying. Yeah. It does say and, he loved John, right? Yeah. Well, See, no, no, it, not, it's not quite. John, writing about himself, himself says, I am the beloved disciple, which yeah. means what? The, 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 way the, Greek, the way the Greek is written, it's very interesting. I am the disciple that Jesus kept on loving. That's what it is. Uh, even what? though he did something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am the disciple that Jesus kept on loving. Oh. Well, it's very interesting, of course, when they formed their first general conference, because we're talking now about discipling people who are not only followers of Jesus, but they in turn are supposed to be discipling others when Jesus is gone, right? So, who ends up being the first general conference president? <laughs> yeah. Is it Jesus's step? Um, James. Jesus' oldest step brother. Step brother. Where did he come from out of the woodwork? James is his name. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was after his death. Yeah. Well, but it's very clear that they knew about how to get the job done because they chose when they needed to. They chose deacons, etc. And they moved on. They, they, had a, they had a driving force behind them at that point in time. And they, they caught the vision and they said, we're not going to let anything hold us back. We're going to move forward. And God is an organized God. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. How long did Jesus teach or train the disciples? About three years. Well, he was... It was three and a half years from the point of his baptism until his crucifixion. <coughs> How much of that time did he spend with the disciples? It's a trick question. Be careful. I, I want to say most of it. Years, okay, some of them, in the first year and a half, some of them, a smaller group, four or five, maybe six, would follow him for a while, and then they'd go back home and work for a while, and then they'd come and follow him for a while, and back and forth. It wasn't until the last two years that he cons consistently had, a, he chose the 12 and they followed him. One year in Galilee, six months, what's called the retirement time, when he took them out into Sire, Tyre and Sidon and off into Caesarea Philippi, etc., because he was wanted to focus specifically on teaching them. And then the last six months, when he's sort of trying to focus everybody's attention on what's going to happen in Jerusalem. So that's, that's the very brief history. Well, okay, what's different about Christianity compared to other world religions? Uh, well, obviously, we could say a lot of things, but in terms of teaching disciples and <coughs> teaching mentors, what's really different about Christianity? One God. One God? But the Muslims have one God. The we Jews ha have one God. We have a risen God who sends us the Holy Spirit, part of Him, okay. to help us but today. We don't have these hundreds of gods, yeah. each one doing a certain job. This yeah. there, is a, there is a concept that, uh, that, that this knowledge of Jesus is to go to the whole world. Uh -huh. And uh, it's our job to do it. We're, we're yeah. also sorry. We also <coughs> encourage to ask question, to read the Bible, mm -hmm. because by a beholding we become da 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 and so on. Oh yeah, I God says, "Let us reason together." Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you have tried to read the Mishnah, or have tried to read the Quran. Of course, yeah. they would tell you that if you want to read the Quran correctly, you have to be able to do it in Arabic. But there's any, there are English translations. If you try to read that, you'll very quickly discover that they're very different than, especially the New Testament, but the entire Bible 
that we have. And the difference is Christianity is a religion that depends on intelligence and thinking and rational decision making. Mm -hmm. Think about that. At its roots, Christianity is a rational faith. Now, there are groups within Christianity that try to make it into something different. We can think of our Pentecostal friends where having an experience is more important than the details of a rational faith. But, you know, Christianity at its basic, un, you know, nature, in my opinion at least, is a very rational, intent to be a, intends to be a very rational decision. Wh why do you think that is? God prizes our um, freedom and intellect above everything. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants um, intelligent beings to visit with. Yeah. Doesn't rational kind of depend on the person who's defining what rationality is? Well, I mean, some think, would say that. Think of um, Paul, mm -hmm. who went to the um, uh, Greeks, mm -hmm. wasn't it? He says the Greeks think that the cross is is um, well I stupid mean, or um, foolishness, well, think, foolishness think, think and it. whatever and <laughs> and they thought it was foolishness uh, so that's the cross is the basic thing to Christianity yeah. and they we're, thought it was foolishness and to us it's not foolishness we're, we're not forced we have the opportunity to choose mm -hmm. and so remember to the to the Romans and to the Greeks Jesus was a crucified criminal. And to believe that a crucified criminal can be your savior, I mean, yeah, we have to admit that's a, that's a pretty big leap. But yeah. If you look at the whole picture, hopefully, and I think most of us do and have, you make up your mind it is rational as against uh, some of the, how can I put this, some of the more... Eastern religions, you're spinning prayer wheels and got prayers on a flag. You just learn it by rote what you do, and it doesn't necessarily mean anything much to you. Well, you know, coming through the 60s, where everything was not rational, yeah. all feeling, all smoke and mirrors, you got so tired of that, your brain wanted to think. And Unless it was on drugs. <laughs> and maybe that's why the health message is so important is yeah. because if we fog our heads, yep. we're going to have a hard time finding God. Yep. We're going to find his substitute. And contrary to what many, many people think, the purpose of our health message is not just so we can live a few years longer. The purpose of our health message is so we can think more clearly about the gospel. And That's have, what and it's have really more about. energy to go out and share it. Absolutely. <clears throat> well, what do you think of the Sermon on the Mount? What do we? What should Christians learn from the Sermon on the Mount? How's that for a big bite? <laughs> you know, like, Matthew five. Go ahead. It's kind of like Christianity is built upside down, isn't it? Isn't everything kind of backwards with the Sermon it, on the Mount? You could say it. It's kind of like very important chapters of Christianity uh -huh. mentioned. I heard such a wonderful sermon by Ivor Myers on Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Jesus was on the Mount when he was on his cross, and he was, he was living the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. All the steps he compared Jesus going to the cross and on the cross with the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was the Sermon on the Mount. He just didn't give the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus lived <coughs> what he taught. Yes. He yes. was the messenger as well as the message. Yeah, yes. exactly. <coughs> Once again, Ken, when you read that, talking about uh, uh, the poor are the ones who are, are, are going to be the favored and the rich are the ones who are going to come up the losers. Um, How did that fit with the Jews? <laughs> well, how does that feel with anybody? It's backwards. Yeah. It's backwards. Yeah. It's backwards. <clears throat> and if you go to Luke 6, verses 20 to 49, where Luke gives his version of the Sermon on the Mount, he says just literally, blessed are you poor. You know, and to the Jews, if you're good, God will bless you. And if you're being blessed, obviously you'll become rich. And if you become rich, then that's evidence that you're a good person, right? 
that seemed perfectly logical to them. Well, but... In it's, the, it's logical, Jay. Come the, on now. <laughs> in the Sermon on the Mount, there's, really there's the so contrast. <laughs> and um, it, it just, it's when you read it, it's like those Old Testament prophecies. Mm -hmm. It's a head scratcher, yeah. you know. It seems like there's parts missing here. Yes. Okay, well, let's, let's, ask, let's talk about that for just a second. If you sit down and just read at a comfortable conversation kind of pace, the Sermon on the Mount, it can't take you more than about 10 minutes. Okay? The, the story seems to imply that Jesus spent most of a day preaching it. So how much is left out? Mm -hmm. A lot. Yeah. Okay? Now, we don't know whether he stopped for a while and healed people and then he came back and preached some more. We don't know exactly how he did that. But there's obviously a lot that's left out. So this must be sort of just an outline of what he preached. It has to be. So what, what, how is that supposed to be helpful? Well, it gives you the important points. Yeah. Well, I know, but it's... <laughs> you'd, it's you'd like the whole sermon, right? The, it's missing parts. That's why we use our intelligence. <coughs> yeah, we search why. other parts of the, of the Bible and, and fill it in. Well, you know, if you, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus attacked almost every one of their favorite ideas. I mean, is that the way you start out as a young preacher <laughs> to make an impression on the crowd? You attack all their favorite ideas. But he was describing the world as opposed to heaven. And when people don't have a vision of heaven, they feel attacked. Mm -hmm. So um, he was speaking of a different kingdom. Okay. Why would he say, blessed are you poor? For example, I think anybody who's poor no poverty is not doesn't feel like a blessing, mm -hmm. so it has to have a deeper meaning. <laughs> well, he was sympathetic in that he was born amongst them. Yeah. Well, and, uh, he had a lot of insight there, and and I think you could take that a step further. I think there were a lot of poor, downtrodden people and slaves. They saw what was going on by the Pharisees and Sadducees. Mm -hmm. you, you, you had to be in it. They had to all been foolish, and we know they weren't. Yeah, they had to have been bridling under that stuff. Yeah. Well, and proof of that is the fact that many of them became Christians later. Yeah. But look, at, if you go to Luke, it says, "Blessed are the poor, the hungry, the weeping, and even the people who are hated." And you go to. The next verse, it says, by contrast, there's something wrong with being rich, full, laughing, or being respected. I mean, is there anything wrong with being respected? No. It depends the kind of respect. <laughs> I'm glad I'm on the favorable end of those blessings. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay. Well, I think that was Jesus' point. I mean, you have all these people in his audience there reaching for those things, and he says that... Listen, why are you going after the, them? Mm -hmm. Go after this. This is better. And okay. that's kind of what he's doing. Well, I know some well-to-do people that I've tried to talk about the Bible with, and they are very comfortable in life. They are secure <laughs> in that they made it themselves, and they're enjoying an ample retirement, travel, fine wine, and all that. And... They don't seem to have any interest in learning anything about the Bible. Uh, they are, have arrived. Okay, so it's, now... Is part of the problem with the King James? Possibly. You know, here in, in the translation that we use frequently, I'm looking here at Matthew 5, and it says, Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. Mm -hmm. Well, that comes across a whole... The whole differently than in the King James where it says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. I think it's the other Gospels, isn't it? Because one Gospel has more specificity. In well, Luke, Luke, Luke says Luke, poor. Yeah. Luke just says plain. <laughs> According poor. to the English uh, that yeah. I have. The, well, yeah. look at the one man who prayed and, and couldn't lift his eyes to God and said, be merciful to me, a sinner. Mm -hmm. He definitely knew he was poor in spirit. He was a tax collector. He probably was actually rich. He was, he was rich, but he rich. knew he was poor yeah. in spirit. 
I heard something today that it really struck home. Um, was on the radio, and it was mentioned that talking about humanity across the board, mm -hmm. there's no difference in how the brain is and the color, particularly the color, and there's no difference in the soul. we are all got it. We don't really know what the soul is, but every one of us is basically the same, and yet mm -hmm. we very click, quickly class ourselves along certain lines, and mm -hmm. always have done. Mm -hmm. I never really thought about it like that. Yeah. Okay, now, let's come to our day, because we, we need, you know, this is what we need to talk about. Remembering what we've said about Jesus so far, what would he teach us today? Now, Ellen White said, if we can take her as an example of an Adventist, the Bible and the Bible alone is to be our creed. Is that what we need? To, oh, by the way, that's Review and Herald, December 15, 1886, in paragraph 16. It's also in Select and Messages, Book 1, page 416, if you want to look it up. What does creed mean? Creed comes from the Latin word credo, which means I believe. Yeah. So our beliefs are to come from the Bible, mm -hmm. and the Bible only. Mm -hmm. That's what she said. I said. would say, okay. So now, if we go out to the world, is our job to teach them the 28 fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Well, yes, because they're based on the Bible. It's going okay. to come up somewhere, but then Christ says in the end, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Somewhere there's an in-between, I think. How do you divide that into 28? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, so, and, and so you're saying, though, that if the 28 beliefs, if, if they were there when Ellen White was there, she would have said, the Bible and the 28 beliefs. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not oh. trying to suggest that. I'm not are, are we trying to <laughs> No, I don't think we are. No, so, I, 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 I'm hoping that the 28 beliefs are not what we believe as opposed to the Bible. The 28 beliefs hopefully are the way we understand the Bible. Well, like an uh, auto mechanic, when you teach auto mechanics to kids, you have the wheel. Okay, let's talk about the wheel. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have the brake system. Let's talk about the brake system. Mm -hmm. Now you have the transmission. Let's talk about the transmission. Yeah. So the 28. Okay, let's talk about uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, yeah. now let's talk about um, the cross. What was yeah. that? And so in order to learn, you have to break the Bible down into yeah. systems just like you do a, a, an auto teacher. So the 28 is 28? the way, well, if we don't want to use the 28, we can go and use Amazing Facts Bible Study, or we can use it as written Bible study, something to give us a handle. We just can't say, um, gee, I don't know where to start. So, yeah. Well, uh, but let's, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it tougher for you. From the very beginning almost, Adventists and then later Seventh-day Adventists have said that our special message to the final people here on this earth is the three angels' messages. Do we know how to explain that to people and everything that it means and all the things it doesn't mean? Was there an effort when Ellen White made that statement about a creed oh. within the church? Some, there were some people trying to formulate uh, uh, some kind of a little creed. You know, some churches oh. do have creeds. Always people who want to put it down in black and white. We really need to get our three angels' message down to something manageable because in the three angels' message you can talk about the whole Bible. Mm -hmm. I mean, the three angel message is all-encompassing. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question. We know that Ellen White, sorry, Ellen White, we know that Jesus chose people primarily from the lowest echelon in terms of education and maybe poverty and so forth, people. And we could have spent a long time discussing why he did that, but let's just leave that for a moment. Do you think that if he'd had the opportunity, Jesus would have chosen a Paul or a Luke as one of his disciples? Now, these are high class, these are people with top level education. Would Jesus have chosen them if they had been available to him? Do you think Paul and Luke needed evidence uh, before they became disciples, and so Jesus knew they would be coming down the pipes after his uh, first... Yeah, I'm sure of that. I'm just asking, if he'd been there on that hillside in Galilee at the point when Jesus appointed his disciples, would he have... Because they were very different than the people he chose. He would have picked Herod if he thought Herod would have been receptive. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 
they were different because Luke was a doctor, an educated doctor, and Paul was a very highly educated Pharisee. Yes. So they were not fishermen. Oh, yeah, exactly. Paul was a very educated Pharisee. Luke was a Gentile Greek physician. Mm -hmm. But yet, Paul and Luke wrote most of our New Testament. Mm. And neither one of them was a disciple. If Jesus would have chosen them, would they have been accepted by uh, the other people? That was what I was trying to ask you. Well, how, how, can you how can you answer that question? I mean, it's an unreal question. And we are, we it's, are, it's, something, it's something that did not happen. We're, he, we're assuming that the, these fishermen are uh, uneducated uh, oafs. And that no, may, no, 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 no. That may not be, that may not be the case. They may, have, they may have had mothers like Jesus who taught okay. them. Okay, okay. You know. I think he knew that basically <laughs> the message, his message that he wanted spread was going to be done by the common man generally. Not exclusively, but generally. Well, there's, okay. there's, there is some unlearning that you have to do for okay. some uh, so Jay smart has, people. So Jay has forced me to do it. <laughs> Desire, <laughs> Desire of Ages, page 250. Here, it, I ha here you have it on the screen. Jesus chose unlearned fishermen because they had not been schooled in the traditions and erroneous customs of their time. In other words, he chose people that he wouldn't have to spend too much time unlearning. Well, right? But... but but Jesus fell into that category himself. Yes. Well, because he was maybe. not, you know, I, I, what I'm taking from that statement is that these guys had not been, did not have college degrees. Well, and or master's degrees. Degree, they had, they were not absolutely buried in Jewish belief. Right. Well, that, to me, that's that's a, that's the same application there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let me read on. They were men of native ability. And they were humble and teachable, although some verses might not seem quite like that. <laughs> Men whom he could educate for his work in the common walks of life. Now Ellen White's talking about our day. In the common walks of life, there is many a man, and I would add women, patiently treading the round of daily toil, unconscious that he possesses powers which, if called into action, would raise him to an equality with the world's most honored men. The touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant faculties. It was such men that Jesus called to be his co-laborers, and he gave them the advantage of association with himself. Never had the world's great men such a teacher. When the disciples came forth from the Savior's training, they were no longer ignorant and uncultured. They had become like him in mind and character, and men took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And of course, that's the Sanhedrin said, remember, they were shocked. Where did these guys get all this learning? And then, oh, oh yeah, they, they did spend some time with well, Jesus. Well, you know, today, Jesus might go through the villages and towns and pick out the gardeners who are doing the lawns or the crop workers who are in the fields and he knows that some of those people have more common sense and more native ability than some college educated people especially if they're and they know how to work world's wisdom and they know how to work two, two so words. i'm going i'm going back to your original question okay would you would um, jesus pick somebody other than that it sounds like the point you're trying to make is that um, he didn't have time to, for these other people to unlearn what they needed to unlearn. Sounds like it, doesn't it? Two words sounds stand like out in that, and that is humble and teachable. Yeah. Humble yeah. and teachable. If you're humble that's and teachable, what, yeah, then, then God, and that's, that under that would, you could have obedience because you're teachable. You, you will, are willing just to learn. Now, how long <laughs> did Paul take to unlearn some of his stuff? Well, what we know is, you mean it's his general education or after he became well, a Christian? After he got smacked off the horse and, and got <laughs> turned years. around. The, now that would have took, now if, if Jesus would have took him at, when he started, it would have used up three years <laughs> just right. getting him turned around again. Exactly. So well, what about Moses? took 40 years yeah. to get yeah. that Egypt education out of him. Okay, now <laughs> let, let me read you one more point. This is from Ellen White again, Acts of the Apostles, page 17. That they might have success in their work, 
they were to be given the power of the Holy Spirit, not by human might or human wisdom was the gospel to be proclaimed, but by the power of God. And you remember, I hope, Zechariah 4, 6. So, so has this happened to everybody? Everybody has to unlearn? What have you had to unlearn, Ken? So the you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> the I power. don't want to know what I had to learn, too. <laughs> I think you're right. I think everybody. We all do. The everybody has to. I, I, I will just tell you this. I was trained and should have been a fully qualified pastor when I graduated from college. And I discovered when I came to medicine that I had unlearned so many things. Unlearned so many things about theology? You went Especially to, theology. You went to medical school and figured out you had to unlearn some things about theology? Yes. So well, are you saying... I ended up with a master's that, degree in theology. Good in Adventist school. education? And we got all I these had, kids we're going to have I, to unlearn again? In my whole education, all my... All, I had three months of non-Adventist education because my dad was drafted into the Air Force and I had three months in a public school in San Antonio, Texas. That, uh, the rest of my education, the entire thing, was in Adventist schools. Well, that's now, not, don't be, people, oh, from, what, from what I see from coming 31 years in the public school, the Adventist schools are doing very, 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 very good. Yeah. And are you well, saying the Holy Spirit comes through humble, teachable people better Okay. But that, that's why Christ told Nicodemus, you must be born again. That's exactly what he was getting at. No one will go to heaven that is not teachable. Yeah. And uh, we don't have time to read these verses, but Zephaniah 2, 3, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jeremiah 50, verse 31, Isaiah 30, 57, verse 15 says <coughs> very clearly, the people that God cannot use are the proud. Okay. Jim, there you go. Now, what is the definition of pride? Pride, well, right in the middle of that, there's a letter that stands up like this. I. I. Yes. It's the same letter that's in the middle of sin. So it's a person that <laughs> thinks uh, like more about I than anything else. Self-centered. Self-centered. Mm -hmm. Self <laughs> right in the middle of sin. Okay, I'm going to ask you my question again <laughs> in a little different way. Do you think Jesus would have accepted a Pharisee or a Sadducee if they were there and they wanted to be a disciple? Except well, Judas. So. Yeah. Would have treated so. them like the rich young ruler. <laughs> and do yeah. a few things and come back. Mm -hmm. Well, it could, have very, it could have very well been that when he spoke with Nicodemus, there was an invitation there. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. And we know I mean, Nicodemus ended up spending his entire fortune to support the early Christian church. He died a poor man, according to Ellen White. And Joseph of Arimathea, we don't know how he found out about Jesus or, or what was his background, but, I mean, maybe he was there when Jesus drove, you know, the people out of the temple and he, you know, he said, here's a man that's getting something done. I, I, don't, I don't know what impressed him, but there's Simon. Of course, he got healed. Was that what made impressed him? We don't know why these people became Christians, they, I mean, these, a, a number of them, I mean, they threw their entire lot, their entire lives into support of the gospel, Christianity. Well, Jesus had a certain ring of truth. Mm. And people, a lot of people are drawn to truth. Maybe some yeah. people don't. But when you're drawn to truth, uh, it's like you don't want anything else after you know the truth. Thank you for saying that. What does that say about what we were talking about a few minutes ago? Christianity is a rational, rational reasonable religion. And it should be always expanding our understanding of the Creator God. We shouldn't be it, s static. It gives you the <coughs> awe experience. I don't, I don't know whether I dare to say this, but I will. I'll take the risk. Are Seventh-day Adventist church leaders known for their humility? Some. Some are. <laughs> I, I won't say anything more. Just asking. <laughs> but I think some of that also can tie into education. I mean, yeah. we've all seen or dealt with or both humble Christian mm -hmm. people that have got <coughs> more than one PhD. Mm -hmm. but we've also come across people that don't have that outlook. They, they think they're everything but walking on water. Yeah. I've noticed a lot of decoration, accolades, awards, 
celebrations of accomplishments mm -hmm. and that maybe tends to make people think they're a success. You read many of the early, write, er, early materials that Ellen White wrote and she says don't compliment the preacher, mm -hmm. don't praise him because they can't handle it. But I mean the professionals in the community, I've just noticed celebration for this, award for this, certificate for this. Um, and okay, so okay. now pulling it together in the last few minutes we have, was Jesus' training and teaching effective? Yes. How would you, how would you, why would you judge it, say yes? Why would you, what would be your, okay, he did this and this and this and this is what happened. What would be the things you would point out? What? The world got turned upside down. That's the world <laughs> got turned upside down. Very good. The very I'm, fact that we're sitting here talking about the Bible thousands of years ago. Exactly. It, yes, speaks to that. Now, Jesus had the one-two punch. He was here. He was the one. And the Holy Spirit is still going with the two punch. So. Yeah, fair enough. But just, just think about it for a moment. In Jesus' day, he lived in what amounted to a little tiny backwater piece of the Roman Empire. If anybody had been there who didn't know about him, and you'd, if you'd walk down the streets of Rome and say, what do you know about Galilee? They would say, huh? Right? And yet we know that this one person who came from Galilee, grew up there, very hardly traveled away from there any significant amount of distance, just around that little backwater, has impacted our world way more than any of the famous scholars in, in Rome or the, the poets or, I mean, and some of them were good. I mean, let's admit, some of them were good. But they, they, they don't even come close to the impact on the world that Jesus has made. Why? You know, there was a historian, a, a history teacher, mm -hmm. that, that he pointed out a couple of things that if it hadn't happened, Jesus would have melted away in obscurity. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't believe that. I just didn't believe that. I think if those little things disappeared, he would still pop out somewhere else. Yeah. And, um, and I just, it just made me grip my teeth every time I think about that guy. <laughs> well, isn't it, I don't want to throw a monkey wrench in here, but I mean, couldn't that same thing be said about uh, Mohammed? Well, he I mean, had, you know, he's had a pretty major impact, that's yeah. Right, and uh, uh, Buddha, maybe, and uh, I don't know any of those Indian gods because there's so many of them. But yeah, hundreds. well, okay, it seems like there's millions, yeah, like Christianity. Baby, there's millions of other people that yeah. believe yeah. in other there's religions. No comparison. Let me read you another quotation <clears throat> from Ellen White: "As Christ's representatives, the apostles were to make a decided impression on the world." Jesus knew he was trained. He knew they didn't know. Jesus knew that he was training people to turn the world upside down. Mm -hmm. The fact that they were humble men would not diminish their influence, but increase it. Why? For the minds of their hearers would be carried from them to the Savior, who, though unseen, was still working with them. The wonderful teaching of the apostles, their words of courage and trust, would assure all that it was not in their own power that they worked, but in the power of Christ. Acts of the Apostles 22 and 23. In other words, Matthew 5, verse 16, what does it say? Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and praise who? Father. The Father is in heaven. And the disciples figured out how to do that. Because people knew that there was no way they could do that just yeah. as normal men. Yeah. They were incapable of having such an influence. Do you think Peter, even when he traveled among the Gentiles, stood up and said, I'm a former fisherman? He could have. Uh, it could well have come into his conversation. I'm just, I'm just asking us to think, think outside the hands, box a little bit. His hands would show it, the calluses. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> He would not look like a learned man. Well, it's clear that in, in, as we look at the rest of the history of the Christian church and the rest of the New Testament, 
that there were other apostles. These would not be disciples, but other apostles that had some pretty major impact. Paul, Luke, Barnabas, Silas, Mark. And they became brave, humble, fearless, courageous, willing to dedicate their entire lives to being ambassadors for Jesus Christ and even to die. What would happen if you came to the typical Adventist church and say, okay, I'm looking for 12 people who are willing to give their lives for the gospel. You're going to leave your job. You're, you're going to throw your entire life on, you know, in the hands of the Holy Spirit, say, God, here I am, use me. What would happen? Well, there are some Adventists doing just that. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't want to call, pour cold water on it, but there's mm -hmm. some that do that and they're kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you find lots of people. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think there were a lot. There would be a lot of people who would say yes. I, I wonder how far it would go. Um, well, it well, it's interesting to notice. As far as yeah. Peter did, and yeah. had to come back two or three times. We know that we've already mentioned this. That a little while later, he chose not only twelve; he chose seventy-two, and apparently he sent them out with ability to heal the sick raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and do marvelous things. I mean, imagine how any of us would feel if Jesus said, I am giving you this power, and I want you to go out and do my work. Those must have really been trustworthy people. Wow. I mean, they, he, you don't get that power. Yeah. Don't we believe it? Lined up a certain way before you got that far, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't we believe that the latter rain is coming? Yeah. And what's going to happen in the latter rain? Hopefully we'll see that kind of thing. You know, sometimes, thinking about the educational challenges of our church, sometimes the older generation in our church look at the young people and we despair. We need to remember that those people, before too much longer, are going to be the leaders in the church. How, what are we passing on to them? How are we training them? Are we doing even close to what Jesus did in terms of teaching them and training them? And what about our nominating committee that we're so famous for? Does our nominating committee follow the principles that Jesus followed when he chose his disciples? Are we choosing, peop choosing people because we like them? Or are we choosing people because they have a lot of skills? Well, our time is up, but I'd like you to think about some questions that have been raised by this lesson that I think really are worth thinking about. See you next week.